Hey guys, welcome to the Monday Night Live Stream, Filling in the Grooves. Uh, I'm your host, Jim Toscano. I've been sick for a week, so I apologize for bailing on everybody last week, um, but I was pretty incapacitated. I couldn't move. I was in bed for a full week. Uh, my dog was very disappointed with me. He kept nudging me. I wasn't moving. He was confused, uh, but we're back and doing it. Um, so thank you for your patience. I just want to mention um, a few things. Up in the corner of my screen, we have uh, my link tree. Uh, you can click that QR code. Uh, you can click the QR code for my mailing list to, f to get on the mailing list and find out about upcoming live streams and my schedule. And um, I also want to uh, thank my companies, Vader Sticks, Prologics Percussion, Offset Pedals, Sabian Cymbals, Black Magic Designs for all the funky electronic stuff which we're going to do a Black Magic Designs live stream soon. I'm talking with my rep this week, and we're going to do a technology live stream finally. And um, also look for upcoming live streams. I'm doing a week, uh, not a week, a month of business live streams. So we're going to have my music attorney, my music accountant, uh, a consultant who is a marketing consultant, and a social media expert. So we're going to get in some business skills, 
live streams as well. So that's coming up pretty soon. And of course, I have to do a shameless plug for my book, Filling in the Grooves, which is over in the left corner of the screen. Uh, pick that up. Hudson Digital um, and also Wisdom Media has it in print. And I have it in print, so you can always hit me up for a, for a signed copy, maybe. Um, so tonight, I have a, um, a good friend and a very special guest. And um, I think we met, you know, I, I keep, it's really funny, every time I have guests on lately, I feel like we've met at PASIC for the first time. And then we m always meet at like a Sabian networking event or something. So we're going to, we will definitely clear that up a little bit. But um, my guest tonight is a uh, first call New York drummer, Broadway veteran. He's currently um, the drum seat for Come From Away. He's gotten into producing. He's played with a whole host of artists over the years. He's an educator. He teaches privately. And um, and he's done just a, a host of beautiful shows on Broadway. And um, I know the Broadway community is struggling, so we'll, we'll probably dip into that a little bit. You know, we'll try to keep it light, but we got to keep it real, right? Uh, so my guest tonight, Larry Lelly. What's up, brother? Hey, Jim. <laughs> Thanks, man. How is I'm glad we could do this, too, oh, after too. missing it last week. I'm glad you're feeling better. Oh, man. Yeah, so much better. Um, uh, thank you for being patient and thank you for rescheduling, which Gosh, which I really appreciate. Um, we're definitely going to, uh, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this in our pre-hang, but we'll we'll check in with the chat. Usually about 730, yeah. like the halfway point, we'll take some questions and see who's awesome. in the I chat. And, um, and, and I know that, you know, there's, there'll be some folks that, um, that don't really know of you yet. And then there's going to be all of our hardcore New Yorkers and, and, uh, tri-state guys that all know you that are, maybe we'll come into the hang. Um, so some of our, our, and that's why I do this on Mondays, by the way, because usually I can get perfect cats that aren't working on Monday, you know, to, yeah. to pop in. So yeah. Um, man, so how are you doing? How are you feeling these days? I'm good. Things are good. Um, I'm very happy that our show is back up and running and everybody is healthy in the building. Again, we had a little COVID scare there, got, had some breakthrough cases yeah. in the building, but everybody was very, because we're all vaccinated right. in the building. So everyone's cases were very mild. Luckily, some were asymptomatic, um, but we're back up and running and so happy to be out there. It was a it was a drag to have to cancel some shows. Yeah, yeah. You know, all those people, yeah, 1,200 people come in there and it's seven o'clock and they're so excited for the show. And we had to say, sorry, everybody. We, we, you know, we don't have enough healthy people in the cast to do the show tonight. Ouch. So yeah, it was hard. It was hard, oh my but God. we're back. Folks, Larry Lelly's going to come out and juggle for you for about 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Instead, instead of the show, I hope you don't mind. Stand up. <laughs> yeah, yes. We'll do some stand up, you know. Oh my Work god. Workout material, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's tough, man. That's tough. And um, you know, it's it's a big production. There's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of um talented people involved, musicians, actors, singers. And then when it when it goes down that hard, it's it's tough on everybody, you know. As far yeah. as, you know, everybody's trying to make a living. That's one thing. Uh, yeah. You're disappointing an audience. Then audiences are starting to get spooked, and they're and they're afraid to come out to theaters. I mean, that's another yeah. thing, right? So exactly, yeah. It was one thing that the that the Broadway community as a whole we were trying to avoid ever having to shut down. Yeah, because that just instills a bit of fear into the audiences. You know, they feel like it's an unsafe space. But yeah. the truth of it is, we've never had any uh, break breakout breakthrough cases amongst the audience members right the audience members have been safe through the whole process it was always the unmasked mostly the unmasked actors right you know or the unmasked musicians who you know play a wind instrument and they can't really have a mask on yeah. so the reality of the situation is going to see a broadway show is a totally safe thing for the audience members yeah they're one of the safest places everybody has to be vaccinated and you have to wear a mask the whole time yeah so we're trying to just keep going and keep letting people know that we're here and we're, we're running again, yep. getting the tourists to come back to New York, you know, and all that good stuff. So yeah. it's, it's been interesting. Um, yeah. It's been interesting. A couple of years. Um, yeah. I keep, I keep thinking like, Oh my God, it's, it's been two full years, right. Since yeah. the initial shutdown. And it's like the time 
it, during it, it felt like time was dragging, right? Like it was going by. But when you look yeah. back, it feels like it just went by like that, like the two years, the last two years oh, yeah. to me. Um, I think because it's it's been so full, you know, it's been, there's something happening every day. Yeah. And, and we're paying attention to it all the time because it's affecting everybody globally, right? Right. So it does make time go fast or feel like it, like it's going fast, even though right at first, I, man, those first few weeks when we didn't know what was going on, yeah, I was just sitting around staring at the walls going crazy. I'm not used to sitting around. I'm like, I like to be active and doing stuff and playing. And it was just the weirdest thing to have all that. You couldn't play. You couldn't go out and, and play a gig. Right. And I've never had that in my life. Yeah. So it was the weirdest feeling to have to like sit home and stare at the walls and especially in a New York city apartment. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> and you know, it's funny. It's like everybody has their, you know, their woes about it. I mean, for us, we had a record come out in March <laughs> and oh, immediately, perfect. you know, like all the supporting shows, you know, um, CD release theater, you know, with, with tickets and everything just tanked. So, yeah. Um, yeah. and you know, for me, luckily I'm, I was sort of, in the technology thing for for a time for a long time and yeah. able to teach online and i was ready for it so yeah. i just went you know it took a transition i mean there were a lot of people that were not ready to move to online so there was a point where i was like oh man like i'm not even teaching like what the heck but then right. once that came together i was pr totally prepared to do it but then so many drummers and educators or or guys that were not educators before had to become educators had to reinvent what they did and yeah. you know we're just not prepared for it and right. still i'm getting guys that call me up and go like hey man i gotta get this online thing together i'm like really <laughs> it's like <laughs> two what? years later two years later but you know <laughs> hey man you know it's it's uh some people get to the table a little bit later than others so and well, that's I'm, maybe been a silver lining to of everything for people to have to pivot and yeah. have to they realize, I mean, you were ahead of the curve on it, but a lot of people realize, oh man, I don't do anything. I don't know anything about tech. Yeah. You know, what, what do I do? And, and then they had time to actually learn or call you and have you help them or <laughs> right. whatever, you know, it was a good thing for people. Now they've got another, you know, kind of trick in their tool bag. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. That they can, that they can use. And, and it's always going to, this is always going to be here now forever. Yeah. That is you know, that now is that we've true. established this online web presence that we need to have to still interact and to learn how to make music and and continue to teach and learn. It's it's that's a silver lining to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. And and like we were saying in the prehang, you know, there are opportunities like doing master classes or doing clinics, online clinics. I even did some school clinics um, when when the school program started coming back, where they were like, "Hey, could you, you know, take." a dozen drummers and take them through warm-ups and routines. And I was like, yeah, totally. Cause you know, I'm set up for that. And um, so yeah. I, I ran routines for, for even schools and, and, um, and I know you've done some online master classes and clinics. So, yeah. you know, like you said, you pivot, you, you figure out what is, you take what's in front of you and you yeah. figure out how to do it along the way. And, and if, yeah. and if you're stuck, there's guys out there that will help you <laughs> for sure. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, I did this one master class that was so much fun. It was, um, it was master's students at a college, uh, like education majors oh, cool. and they weren't drummers. None of them were drummers. Oh, wow. And so we did a thing to teach educators how to work with their drummers. Say they get plopped in a high school somewhere and they've got to work with a jazz band and they need to know how to tell their drummer how to play with the bass player or what they should be doing, what this groove is like. And, and so there were maybe 15 students in the master class. And I said, all right, everybody, just r run through your house, rummage through your house, find a cardboard box. And you're going to use that for a kick drum and find like a can, go in your closet and find some kind of metal can, you know, that's going to be your hi-hat symbol. And we just like made up drum sets out of found items in their house. And it was a hoot. We had a great time. Oh my God. And they're like playing with chopsticks or whatever they had, you know, it was <laughs> coat, coat hangers. It was fun. You gotta you just gotta roll with it sometimes. That's it, man. Oh my god, <laughs> that's creative. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think you know I want to 
get your your story. And but before we do, I, I am going to mention. So I believe that we met. The first time we met may have been at a PASIC uh, oh. clinic that uh, Joe B. I I believe that um he was kind of emceeing it a little bit. Um, but it was you, Andres, Joe B. Oh yeah. Oh, and um, Lion King percussionist. Um, yeah, Rolando. Rolando, uh-huh. and uh-huh. You, and you guys did this wonderful presentation. Oh, and also um, uh, the gent that was playing with Frozen at the time. Yeah, Sean McDaniel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you guys did such a great job. It was, for me, it was, uh-huh. you know, especially because I bring students to Pasic, uh, yeah. and that year I had three students with me, I think. And, um, it was one of the most enlightening and, and useful clinics to the students oh, nice. for sure. It was entertaining because you guys are great. Um, and it, and it really offered something that they were going to learn from something that they could take away from it. And it's, and something that was real, you know, cause some, you know how some clinics are just chop fests, you know, right. it's like, okay, right. you know, I'm going to play every lick I know. And, and everybody's like, Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. Great. I can't <laughs> right. do any of that. Um, and then, but then it's like coming to a clinic like that where you're like, Hey man, you know, I came to town and I paid my dues and I, you know, you told your story and yeah. that really resonated with me and, and definitely the crowd. So, I appreciate oh, that. And I believe yeah. that was the first time that you and I um, met. Um, and then the second time, or this could be in reverse order, uh, Drummer's Collective at a Sabian hang, I think. And All then right. we went to a diner afterwards. Yeah, around yeah, the corner that's right. And we just hung, right? So Yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that that that's something I always bring up because for drummers, we're this extended family of, like, misfits. and But we... We have this camaraderie and we hang. And it's yeah. it's not like that, you know, I, I always make this joke. It's, there's not a bunch of bassoon players going to like <laughs> a, a convention center, you know, like right. sharing right. ideas with drummers or going to a, to a bassoon hang where they're like right. oogling over cymbals and, and yeah. eating pizza together, you know? So like, right. you know, it's very cool. What is it? You're very, it's very true. There's a brotherhood and a sisterhood of drum in the drum community. And like, you can just throw a bunch of drummers together from different, you know, locations and genres and whatever, and they'll just hang and get along. Yeah. Something like that. But you, you can't do that with guitarists or, or something, or, you know, no. it just doesn't work that way. It's what, there's something to being a drummer. Maybe it's, I'm just kind of ruminating on it. Maybe it's because we're always the ones who's keeping it all together. Yeah. We're always got to watch out for everybody else to keep, the unit together. Maybe that's why it is. I don't know, I, but it, it is, it's a family. It's always been that way. Yeah. It's total, awesome. Total family. And, and that's why this, like with this, this show for me is such a great thing because drummers come and hang and listen to us talk about drums <laughs> and we nerd out on like yeah. gear or we nerd out on records. And, but then, yeah. um, you know, like I'll talk to James Gadsden one week and we just, it's the same thing. We're just, both talking about oh yeah man that record that groove on that record you know and, it, and you just <laughs> and then it's like you know hanging with um like last two weeks ago i did a um uh vintage drum night with a couple friends and yeah. we're like talking about vintage drums and then i had billy cobham on and we're just chatting yeah. about like you know his experiences it's just crazy yeah. how we really it it kind of it's it's like a level playing field when we get together and we talk and yeah. i feel like you know yeah. i feel like it's it is all family, so yeah, it's great. So it's um, great your dreams, Jim. I love it. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I I want to get kind of the the beginning. So for me, <laughs> like I love finding out when the initial spark happened, where you went, ooh, drums. I want to do that. Yeah. Um. So yeah. what was the like the moment? What was the ignition for you? Well, I my earliest memories are are playing drums. I wanted to play drums. And I always was just, I mean, I was just doing the thing where you drag all the pots and pans out of mom's cabinets and you ruin everything (laughs) until they finally, you know, you wear them down and they get you a a toy drum, you know? So that was, that's one of my earliest memories is having that toy drum. It's just what I always wanted to do. What I do remember is I didn't get a lot of support about it early on from the community or from my family. They were all like, oh, whatever, you're banging that thing. That's whatever. Have fun. Yeah, yeah. But I was watching the Muppet show 
which, you know, anybody who's seen that show, th- those are badass musicians playing on that show every week. Yeah. And I was a kid, I was probably like 10 or 11 or 12 or somewhere in there. And Animal and Rita Moreno came out and did a duet. They did Fever. Wow. And I was just like, what? This is something that you can do? Like, <laughs> I'm going to do that. I'm going to play drums with the pretty girl and have, you know, it's just like, it, I, that was what kind of made me realize, oh, that's something people do. And it was funny that it was the Muppets and it was Animal. Yeah, so. <laughs> Dude, I have to tell you, you're not the first person to tell me that their earliest influence as a drummer was yeah. Animal from the Muppets. Yeah. I mean, who was it? Was it Hal Blaine playing on a lot of those? Yeah. I don't even know who was playing on that show most of the time. But have, they were great. Those I, musicians were great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's really funny. Nate Morton, um, drummer yeah. for The Voice. Right. He yeah. was on and he uh, cited Animal as like one of his early influences. Yeah. Um, I also have to say that Carmen Apice, when he was on the show, said that that um, it was his idea to do the drum battle with Animal. Oh, and he had this great oh. idea and he pitched it to to Jim Henson uh-huh. and Henson uh, apparently oh, no. said Hey man, yeah. that is a great idea. I have good news and I have bad news. We <laughs> yes. love the idea. We're definitely going to do it, but we're yeah. going to do it with Buddy Rich. <laughs> right. so it was like, and yeah. you know, the funny thing is, if you look at Animal and you look at Carmine uh, and you do a side by side, yeah, right, right, kind of looks like Carmine, doesn't he? You know, I love like, it. he's got the mustache, he's got the crazy hair, so. Right. <laughs> that's pretty funny so but Rita Moreno so that was the first time that yeah. someone mentioned that particular clip so that's cool uh-huh. oh it's so great it's on it's on YouTube you can find it everybody should go watch it it's so cool I I love the music clips even that they did later um you know there's there's all these guest musicians even on Sesame Street like if you, yeah. if you go through them there's all these great duets with like different yeah. Muppets from the show. Sure. And NPR, yeah, yeah. So that's very cool. I know that yeah. the that the drum battle was definitely a big one for me. Um, oh, I love that too. Yeah. You know for sure, and just watching the Muppets playing music was always exciting, yeah. right? So yeah, yeah. Now you that can go fun. on. You can go on YouTube and you can find like um people that have taken the footage and uh-huh. then put it with different music. So like, there's oh. a Rick Astley one where they're doing. Um, <laughs> oh, no. What's that tune? <laughs> Never going to give you up. Never going to give you up. So it's Beaker doing Rick Astley. And then there's there's one that's um, death metal Muppets. And so they slowed it down. And so it's like, you know, one of these really cookie monsters sounding like death metal tunes. And Beaker's (laughs) mouth is slowed down. So it's like going. Yeah, it's pretty funny. So um, so Muppets, right? Put it kind of. That was like the, the spark when I was like, oh, I this is something I can do. What age would that be, do you think? That was like 10, 11, somewhere in there. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And so then I was like full court press on getting the drum set. I was like, I got to have this thing. You got to. They were in school, you know, they ask you at, like in fourth grade or something. They say, what do you want to play? You know, you want to be in the band? I was like, yeah, I want to play drums. No, oh, that's nice. We got too many drummers. Here's a trombone. And wow. they made me do that for a year. And I hated it. I was like, this is awful. I don't want to, you know, it's terrible. And uh, they f- finally, we moved to an- another school district. And luckily there was a really cool music teacher there. And he's like, you know what, you know, what instrument do you play? And I was like, well, I got this trombone, but I hate it. I really want to play drums. He's like, well, great, Here, go play drums. You know, and <laughs> wow. it, was, it was beautiful. That's and that's where we started. Life began. <laughs> wow. I was so lucky. And this guy was like 80 some years old, still teaching you know, a band in like the junior high school. And he, how did this go down? It's a really cool story. Somehow he heard that like I had a drum set at home, but I was just, you know, like screwing around. I didn't know how to read music. I had blown off all the trombone lessons. I've just, you know, I was just doing my own thing. And he said, he, he like called me out of class down to the band room said, and had a one-on-one with me and me and this 80 year old guy. And he said, I, I heard that you play drum set. And I said, yeah, I got a drum set, you know, yeah. And he's like, okay, cool, we're gonna play. And he pulls out his upright bass and he has me sit down at the drum set and he puts some music in front of me. 
And he said, okay, let's just play. And I said, I don't know what any of this is. He's like, just, just do what you think you should do. <laughs> and we sat there and played and it was magic. Oh my God. And I was like, oh, we're making music. We're doing something here. And, and he could tell, you know, right away that I couldn't read music at all, but he knew I had instincts for it. Yeah. So he said, I'm going to form a, a jazz band with you. I'm going to pick some people and put them together. And we're going to, we're going to play. We're going to learn how to play jazz. And I was like, it was the coolest thing in the world. Oh my God. I mean, that's incredible. So, yeah. He, he was, he was looking for those special kids that had something and wanted something, but didn't know how to get there kind of thing. Yeah. And so he just broke it wide open and he called the high school and said, Hey, there's this young kid here. He needs to learn how to read music and how to play drums and percussion and stuff. So the high, he convinced the high school band teacher to come to the middle school during the day and give me lessons. Oh my God. So I started learning how to read music and, you know, I got a bell kit and the, you know, the practice pad and started learning rudiments and things like that because I was a very lucky young boy and music. This is why I'm such an advocate for arts in the schools. Cause if I, if they hadn't had those, you know, professors, I mean, the teachers and had, an arts program had a band program because they're getting cut from so many schools. I'd probably never would be doing what I'm doing. Oh my it was, I was so lucky. So lucky. See, this is, you know, mentorship is like yeah. the freaking key. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's all about, yeah. you know, if, if that's you're why lucky, I do this, I mentor people all the time. I pay it forward that way all the time. Cause I was really lucky at key points in my progression to have somebody wonderful step up and kind of take me under their wing and say, Hey, I see you want to do this. Yeah. I see you can do this, but you need, you need me to show you, you need me to help you a little bit, or you need a little nudge. But I can point, I can just point my whole career path. Oh my you know God. how it went. Yeah. It's wild. Who is, that who is that guy? What was his name? Uh, Mr. Von Klein. I don't remember his, Mr. his Von first Klein. name. Shout out Von. to Mr. Von Klein. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great job, he was amazing. Man. He was amazing. And then the high school teacher who came, that was Rick Young, and he retired a few years ago. Where was this, by the way? So this is in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. So uh, we're in, in Chicago, but then we moved to Wisconsin. And this was in a little town. Let's see. That was in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Is that near Wauwatosa? No, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> I got a buddy, a keyboard player at Hal Leonard in Wauwatosa. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> Wisconsin. There's um, a lot of good music there because there's nothing else to do in the winter, you know, <laughs> you yeah. around and you freeze your butt off and <laughs> it was great. It's, and that's where I went to college too. And it was great. I went to um, the university of Wisconsin at Eau Claire. Yeah. And we we're just starting this brand new jazz program there. The first year that I got there and I was again, so lucky they hired a new jazz director um, Robert Baca, who was hot off the Buddy Rich Big Band. He was the lead trumpet player in the Buddy Rich Big Band. Oh, wow. And I showed up as a freshman and he proceeded to kick my butt because he was like, you think you can play drums? <laughs> <laughs> I just got done playing with Buddy Rich Big Shot. You know, you're going you're gonna, to, and they, it was great. Wow. And I had a great percussion teacher there too, Ronald Keezer, who unfortunately passed away last year. Mm -hmm. But wonderful, wonderful teacher. And they all kicked my butt in the perfect way. Right. In the right yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Wow. Yeah. Um, back to, back to the high school thing for a second. So when, when you were, you know, so now you're, you're starting to play and, and you're understanding music, you're, you're starting to read, you're learning percussion. Were you doing any sort of band stuff outside of school? Like, did you have your own band or were you oh, yeah. forming bands with kids? Yeah. In ninth grade, as soon so ninth grade was high school for me. Mm. And as soon as I got there, like there was not, there weren't a lot of drum set players in the school for whatever reason, but people were already knowing about me because of the junior high band. And I was starting to teach lessons. So it was just kind of ironic. I didn't really know how to read music that well, but I was starting to teach younger kids right. drum lessons and basically just helping them to figure out how to, play the drum, you know, just like how to play a groove or how to listen to a record and cop that feel off of there and mimic it and stuff like that. So anyway, 
when I got to high school, I like it was the probably the first week of high school, and these you know three kids come up to me, these three upperclassmen. I think they're going to beat me up or something, you know. And they're like, "Hey, we hear you play drums. You know, meet us in the band room after school. We're going to jam." And I ended up um, forming a band with them, and then we played all through four years of high school together. It was great. Oh wow! And it was like you know whatever metal of the day really hard rock stuff yeah i was you know i was into neil pert and triumph and acdc and black sabbath and yeah. ozzy and all that stuff and so we were like a hair metal band at the cool. time i had hair back then <laughs> <laughs> yeah man. we had a great time though it was a blast oh my god so yeah we were on a similar trajectory because ninth grade uh I had already, I had a band in middle school that was like sort of doing gigs and we were like classic rock kind of band. But we were, we're doing gigs in middle school? Yeah, yeah. So we, we played awesome. like, we played like Brooklyn College, like, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, out, outdoor festivals. We played, we got involved with BACA, which was the Brooklyn Arts Council. And so we would play all of the street fairs around Brooklyn. Um, oh, that's great. Like, so eighth grade, you know, we were like this little hippie band. We had like... um you know, army jackets and patches, peace patches and stuff. <laughs> right, but we were right. playing sort of like um, classic rock, but then we, we were taking an interest in Rush. So we were starting to get into progressive stuff. Um, yeah. But in high school, I formed a metal band with some guys uh, and we were playing gigs. We played like Lamour in Brooklyn, which was a big wow. metal venue at the time. Yeah, And we were yeah. opening up for like Carnivore and like these, these wow. bigger bands, cool. you know? Yeah. Um, and that I was, was such I, an experience to do. Oh, yeah. I was probably yeah. the only, you know, when I was a young kid, my mom would drive me to the gig with her, <laughs> with her car, drop me off with this giant double bass kit. Right. And I was probably the only drummer that brought a vibraphone on stage, like oh, at Lemoore. So we had like progressive yeah. little parts and I was playing vibraphone. But um, Ow. I was into the metal thing as well. And, um, and we, we had an original metal band called Axis. And we would do the Battle of the Bands and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of funny. Ninth grade, tenth grade, you know, around that time. Oh my goodness. Oh, I think we have a frozen. Uh, oh, there we go. We are unfrozen. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. My my, your the Zoom window froze for a second, but then you came right back. Oh, you know what's really oh. funny? I have to tell you. Two a couple of weeks ago, I had Daru Jones on, and uh, uh -huh. Daru was making a joke. And he turned this way and smiled, and then the computer froze. And so he was stuck for like five minutes like this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I go, what a perfect way to have him freeze. So I like I put on one of his records and I was playing music while he was frozen in the corner. It was pretty funny. <laughs> so um, all right, so like high school, ninth grade, you got your band, yeah. and you stayed with those guys throughout high school. Um, sort yeah. of playing metal and stuff like that. Were you guys doing local gigs or? Yeah, we played at like the American Legion or the Knights of Columbus or right. the school dances. Yeah. Which weren't really a dance when we played them because people just kind of stood there and watched us. <laughs> and watched you. Yeah, yeah. We were pretty good. The band was really good. Our, we had a killer guitarist um, and he could do all that stuff. Like he was really into Van Halen and all that, you know, all those great guitarists at that time. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, it was it was a blast, and to figure out, I mean, we were starting to learn little business chops too, like how do you promote your gig? How do you get people to know you're you're playing a concert at the country club, and you want everybody to come out on Saturday right. night? You know, this was back before the internet, so we're making flyers, you know, and we're going door to door and mailers and all sorts. Of, you know, yeah. it was good. It was a good experience, and to figure out how to structure a show. Yeah. So that it's a good time for the crowd, you know, not just playing all your favorite tunes and showing off all your chops, but like actually making it a night, yeah. a concert, you know? So it was a great experience. I loved it. And it was a, just a blast. Maybe that's so when much. you started to get the little uh, producer hat started to kind of maybe. develop maybe at a young age. <laughs> yeah. Could be. Yeah. But it was, we had so much fun. It's funny pre pre playing when I was probably nine or ten uh -huh. we were dressing up like kiss and we were putting on <laughs> yeah. kiss concerts in my mother's garage so yeah. i had a drum kit that was like 
you know, one of those toy drum kits that somebody was getting rid of and it wasn't even uh-huh. a real set. I didn't even know how to play yet. And we had guitars and basses with no strings on them that we found the bodies of these guitars. Uh-huh. And so we would put on a live two and right. we would do the show <laughs> with like road flares, candles. <laughs> we had ladders, like you yeah. go up the step ladders. My hey. drum set was on a picnic table. So I was like on a riser and we were Ow. charging tickets. So kids yeah. would come and pay a dollar to come in or whatever it was to see wow. us lip sync yeah. the Alive yeah. 2 record. Yeah. <laughs> that was what you did back then. You like did it up. You, you know, you, I, we made lights out of coffee cans and we'd go to Radio Shack and buy part electronic parts and mixers and things. And you were, everybody's plugged into one amplifier. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're, but you're just trying to make it a show. You're trying to do it. I love that, man. Oh, my God. That's picnic crazy. table. That was a perfect idea. Get up there on the picnic table. So would you guys do the makeup and everything? Oh, yeah. And and oh. there was a kid uh, that was playing Gene Simmons that his older brother was a good artist. And so uh-huh. he drew the makeup on us beautifully. Uh-huh. And cool. somewhere we have, my mom probably has them, we have pictures of us in the Kiss makeup, little boys, basically, yeah. with, like, bicycle yeah. chains. You know, we tried to make <laughs> costumes. <laughs> And um, snow boots for like you know the kiss right. boots, and right. um, but with perfect makeup, you know, like these <laughs> little kids with perfect makeup. Um, I love it. Yeah, it's really oh, that's fun. Great. <laughs> uh, so so now like the high school days, you know, so you're doing gigs, you have your band, and then um, when you headed to college, did you went through the audition process for that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, at that point, you were able to read. Were you able to sort of sight read? I was charts? able to sort of read drum music at that point. Yeah. But I still wasn't really, I wasn't really working on it. I just was playing by ear most of the time. Okay. Because I was just a natural, I just had, I just seemed to know what to do with things. And it's all I did in my spare time. I just right. sat in my bedroom and dissected records and worked on playing along with them over and over and over until I could figure them out. I mean, I remember when those first Missing Persons albums came out and I was just like, what is this guy doing, Terry? Oh my God, he's like yeah. orchestrating at the drum set. And I sat and just figured it out. So I had, I, what did we do for, I didn't do a drum set audition for college. It was a percussion audition. Oh, okay. Because they wanted me uh, to come there and be a percussion major. And that may- meant you had to learn everything, not just be a drummer. So for so the I audition, played like a, snare drum, bells. And yeah, snare bells. drum, like a little xylophone etude or something like that. It was yeah. pretty, pretty basic. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, you know, this is another part of my story, which is probably a good thing. Um, I don't know what would have happened to me if I would have like got gone off to Berkeley or North Texas State or Miami, which were the three big hot schools at that time. Right. I was broke. I didn't, you know, I didn't come from money or anything. I didn't, I couldn't afford the $50 application fee for Berkeley. I remember that was like why I didn't try to go to Berkeley because I didn't have the 50 bucks. So um, the the school at Eau Claire, the college at Eau Claire, that percussion teacher had taught me in a, a summer jazz camp for a week. And he, he saw that I had something there too. So he kind of started grooming me and, getting, you know, kind of dangling the carrot in front of, you know, well, if you come to Eau Claire, we probably get you a scholarship, you know? And, and so I was like, oh, I'm going to check that out. And luckily they did uh, give me a little scholarship to get me to go there that first year. But again, why I'm saying this was a good thing for me, because I didn't know shit. I, you know, I didn't know how to read. I, I didn't, I'd never had an official drum set lesson at that point. Um, and I couldn't, I could barely play the other percussion. I was really just kind of floating on my natural ability to listen and play along to things, right? right? So it was good because they had the time to kick my butt. And and I was like, oh, I'm here, I'm here at college and I'm here to play drum set for everybody. And they said, nope, here's the, your marimba mallets. Go in that room and practice, learn how to read, do all these scales. And I was furious. <laughs> I was so mad. I'm like, I'm going to be a drummer. You know, I want to, I don't want to do any of this stuff. That's right. You can already play drums. Okay. You're going to play marimba now. Then the next semester. Okay. Here's your timpani. You're going to play timpani this semester. And I was so mad, 
but it ended up being the best thing for me because it made me a more well-rounded musician. Yeah. Oh my God. So by the time I was a junior in college, my professor finally said, okay, you're ready to learn drum set now. And then he proceeded to kick my butt nice. with that. It was great. Oh I hated God. it. It was great though. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like well, I cursed, I cursed everybody's name so much. I was in the practice room for hours, you know, with stick control. Yeah. He, he had all these ways to break up the stick con control book around the drum set, you know? And so, and then the Chapin book with the four way independence and, oh man. Yeah. But it was so good for me. It all ended up being stuff that I needed to work in the real world. Right. So that when I got out of school, I wasn't just full of all these chops with nowhere to go. I actually had some skills and some experience. Right. Because we did all these musicals at the college. We did operas and uh, just concert band performances. I mean, it was great. We actually put together a whole show that was like a Broadway show. It was kind of a review. Right. Where we orchestrated all the charts and did the arrangements and I conducted the orchestra. I mean, I got to do all these things because I was at that school where I might not have had that experience if I was at North Texas state or whatever and playing right. in the, you know, I don't know how many lab bands there are now, but I probably <laughs> would have been in the eighth lab band, you know, like <laughs> the lowest one. Not the one o'clock you know. lab band. Yeah. Right. You know, it's kind right. of funny. The, um, you know, what you said before about the, with the schools, but it's, it really is, the school doesn't make the player and it's, it's totally what you make of it. I mean, you, there was an opportunity there. You stuck it out, even though you were miserable for a time, yeah. <laughs> um, but you, there was an opportunity for you and, and you made the most of it. I mean, that's brilliant, really. Yeah. Um, because would... maybe you would have been lost in the sauce at, at Berkeley. You know, there's so many drummers and it's like, yeah. you know, that, that can really weigh on somebody's, psyche just being with that many players and and feeling that competitiveness and maybe oh, you know just being in the in the arena that you set yourself up for it was just the perfect positioning you know it gave you real world yeah. experience you know so many people take that stuff for granted like concert band and doing the shows in school even in the high school level that that's what is grooming you for real world music experience you know yeah it's, yeah absolutely so. and i've you know since I moved to New York and I meet so many young musicians coming right out of music school, moving to the Big Apple, ready to make it, you know, I won't name any certain schools, but there have been many a time when somebody comes out of whatever big fancy music school and they can't read. Yeah. Actually can't read a chart. They've got chops for days and they can do their thing, but they can't actually do a gig. And I'm like, oh, you ready? You want to do a gig? Okay, here's the book. You know, here's the music. What do you mean? I need a, I need a recording of this. I need a week to work on it first. I was like, no, this is the music and you're going to play the session today. Yeah. You're going to sight read it and lay it down and better be perfect. And it, it's shocking that, that they're getting out of school without having real world skills that they need. Isn't it amazing know? how many guys still will, will, that you'll meet and they'll think that the reading part is not important. Like I was at an 802 union hang a bunch of years uh -huh. ago and it, and it was, it was a, um, it was, I guess it was sort of a little seminar on people that wanted to get into playing Broadway um, oh, okay. that they did at the union. Bernard yeah. Purdy was there and oh, um, nice. a couple of drummers were like, you know, I guess with the advent of, of shows like rock of ages and stuff like that, they were like, Oh, like you don't really have to know how to read though, right? Because you can, you know, you can get like a rock musical and it's like, no, you have to learn how to read. How many rock musicals do you think there are, first of all? Right. Um, and second of all, you need the skill set. Like I, I couldn't believe, and these were older guys like like downplaying the reading thing. And I was like, yeah. what? Yeah. No, so, it's a thing. Yeah. And it's, you need it more than ever now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Um <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we should pause and jump into the chat for a moment because oh, um, there are right. a few people saying hi. And hi. just so that we make sure we don't make them feel left out and forgotten. Uh, we'll check into the chat real quick and then we'll, we'll get back into it. But um, so first up, uh, Anthony Cusina saying, greetings, gentlemen. Anthony, how you doing? Always good to have you in here. My young student, Lucia, hanging with us. She says, uh, hi, Jim and Larry. How's everyone doing tonight? Bob Sears up in New Hampshire. Hanging with us. 
Uh, he said he's back. Uh, he's glad I'm back on my feet, which thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. Um, let's see. Lucia is saying hi to Bob. My mom is in here. Oh, my mom's hi, mom. Mom, we were, we, were, we were talking kind of about, you know, the early days with you driving me to Lamore with my yeah. double bass Ludwig kid. Uh, <laughs> uh, Lucia has a question. She says, Larry, who is your biggest inspiration as a drummer? Wow. Besides Boy, Animal from the Muppets. Yeah. <laughs> how do you pick just one? Yeah, it's hard to pick. Because I went through phases. I mean, don't we all kind of go through phases? Yeah. Like when I first discovered Buddy Rich, I was like, you know. My mind was blown yeah. and I had to listen to every single Buddy Rich album I could get my hands on, you know, and then the same with Neil Peart or, or like I said, Terry Bozio, or, I mean, and then when Weckl came on the scene, give me a break. Oh my you God. Know? <laughs> it was all Weckl all the time. I just couldn't, I couldn't even put my head around what he was doing. You go into the club, heard... like in, in New York, you go into a club and just sit next yeah. to him and watch him play and you'd yeah. still be like, yeah. what the hell is happening? <laughs> Why does this guy play so perfect? Like, what is happening? <laughs> so funny, man. I know. No, but so there's not one. It's, and I don't think anybody should have just one, right? Yeah. There's, exactly. everybody's doing their own thing out there and coming at, at it from a different way. And they've got their own style and their own sound and their own touch, their own feel. 100%. And so I just wanted to kind of soak it up uh, what everybody was doing. You know, there's just so much great music out there. And then when I got to New York, and I met all these cats that you just don't know kind of outside of New York City. Everybody knows who they are in the city, but outside, like just because they aren't on a national platform or whatever, or right. touring with a high profile artist or something. But there, I mean, all those cats that were just playing sessions after sessions after sessions that you wouldn't know until you were here. I mean, it's, right. it's, it's a one, it's still a great place to be, still full of great musicians. Yeah, 100%. Um, John Gill hanging with us from Oneonta, New York. Um, mm. Michael Abruzzo, who's a childhood friend of mine hanging. Hey, Michael. Uh. Haven't spoken to you in many decades. <laughs> Welcome. Um, Steve Balgoyan is hanging with us. He said that he remembered that Muppet show, by the way, with Rita Moreno. Yeah. And uh, so. he said, great show, guys. Jim, a good future guest might be Michael Jokum, who played Animals Parts in the more recent drum battle with Dave Grohl. Oh, really? wow. I didn't know about that. Cool. I didn't know about that either. Thanks for uh, hipping us to that. Um, Anthony Casina said, hi, Larry. We met at the Collective some um, years yeah. ago. Uh, good yeah. to see you. My question to you is, what do you think of the music scene today? Ah, that's a good question. This is going to keep it real here. It's rough. It's rough these days. Yeah. It's um, and not even and this is before the pandemic. You know, there are just uh a lot of the recording scene, the recording industry has moved elsewhere, at least talking about New York City, uh, because it's so expensive to record in New York City. And it's expensive for the studios to maintain that kind of massive real estate in Manhattan. So a lot of the big recording studios have shut down, went out of business. Some of them are now luxury condos, luxury apartment buildings, right. you know, like the Hit Factory. Is apartment buildings. Yeah. So that kind of work dried up quite a bit in the city as far as what used to be here. You know, it used to be Steve Gadd was doing, you know, five sessions a day every single day and had three different drum kits, you know, going from one studio to the next. It's not like that anymore. Yeah. There are still recording work here, still some film work. Um, some of the new series, uh, like the Marvel, what's it, Marvelous Maisel on Netflix. They record all their music in New York. A lot of series will record their music in New York. Right. Um, a lot of the recording studios have moved to outer boroughs just because there's more real estate available and it's a little less expensive. Right. Um, but a lot of guys do what you do now. You have your own your own room. Yeah. Your drums are always set up. They're all mic'd up. You know what what they're gonna do. You know with how to give somebody what they want. And so a lot of producers and artists will hire someone like you, Jim, to just lay down the drum tracks for their session and float, you know, fly them over. Um, it's rare when you get to do a big session with a full orchestra or a full band right. all at the same time anymore. It's just got cost prohibitive, unfortunately. Yeah. And, but gigging overall, I mean, I know some cats who used to make 
a really good living doing just wedding dates. Yeah. Every weekend they do or and bar mitzvahs or bat mitzvahs or whatever, corporate events and parties and things like that. Even that work is has slowed down a little bit. Slowed down a bit, yeah. It's smaller. Yeah. yeah. The nineties, I would do five of those a week. Yeah. Do great. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can make a really good living doing that. Yeah. You know. So that work has slowed down. But the one thing that has been consistent, and that's why I feel so fortunate to have gotten into is the Broadway world. Right. Shows are more popular than ever. Uh, there's big money to be made in shows. So there's a lot of people who are developing musicals right. these days. They're big, big money makers. And if, and if you get a hit, you can reproduce that show and put it all over the world. Yep. You know, like come from away. We're very lucky that we were a big hit. Um, we got all the, the details right and made a really good show about a really good story that connected and resonated with people. And we had five productions around the world running, be you know, before the pandemic shut them down. Right. Uh, Hamilton was the same way. You know, when you get a really big hit, you just take that same thing you did and you re replicate it and put it in London or put it in Toronto or put it a sit down in Los Angeles. So show work, Broadway show work, musical theater is still and has become one of the best gigs in town. Yeah. And, and now because there's not the session scene that there used to be, you've got all those great musicians in New York City who are looking for gigs and they're playing Broadway shows now. So I was so lucky when I came here in the 90s and I went into one of my first Broadway pits and I was like, man, that's John Beale playing bass over there. I've been listening to him on records, you know, since the 60s. I mean, he, he was playing bebop records in the 60s. Right. You know, and he's playing a Broadway show. And there's, you know, Dave Spinoza, one of the best guitarists, session guitarists ever in the world. And he's playing a Broadway show. I was like, wow, man, I, I really lucked out. Yeah. these cats are smoking and so the the bands are great the musician and the level of musicianship is wonderful it's higher than ever and so while that's great it also makes it super competitive yeah because there are only 41 broadway theaters in new york city and that usually means well and and like a third of them will be straight plays not musicals right so that means there are only you know maybe 30 25 to 30 musicals who will need one drummer right or maybe one percussionist and one drummer at yep. the most you know so it's super competitive to get into that scene and you better be really really good because you're playing with dave spinoza over there you know you're playing <laughs> exactly. with legends of the industry oh, so God. that's kind of my look at you know the new york music industry at the moment yeah and you know I mean, for, for musicians that are, you know, like Joe B, Joe Bergamini and I have this chat all the yeah. time. You have to wear a lot of different hats. Yeah. If, if you're not fortunate to be in, in a steady situation, you just need to wear a lot of different hats. You know, be, be ready when opportunity knocks, so be prepared. You're, you get luckier the more prepared you are, the more lucky you get. Um, yeah. But if, if a tour comes up, be ready for that. If you're teaching lessons be ready for that you know treat everything the same treat everything with that professionalism and you know you can you can make a living in this business wearing a lot of different hats if if you so choose you know so yeah it will be easier for you to to make a living yeah the more you can do the more the more kind of genres you can play and the more instruments you can play like especially if we're talking drums and percussion here you know if you can play timpani if you can play hand uh, Latin percussion, if you can play the mallet instruments, you know, vibraphone or marimba or that kind of stuff, yeah. you will have more opportunity. Yeah. And this is a good thing that, that I can tell everybody about how I got my first shot was playing percussion on Broadway, it was not a drum set book. Right. It was a percussion book. And because my teacher was smart enough and made me learn marimba and timpani <laughs> and all that stuff. I was able to do it. Yeah. If I hadn't had those skills, who knows what I'd be doing now. Right. I might have been, you know, it can take a long time to break into Broadway. It's very competitive. Yeah. So the but more skills that you have, 
you know, the yeah. more well-rounded you are, obviously there's more opportunity. So, yeah, exactly. And, and like in a show like come from away, you're playing some hand percussion as well. So it's like, you know, n- learn everything, <laughs> you know, it's really, yeah, learn everything you can soak it all up, listen to every kind of music, you know, right. don't poo poo anything because the more, you know, and the more you can do. And, you know, as you and Joe talk about shows are very, different these days you know a show like in the heights came along where you had to know you know what's a cumbia what's a samba what's salsa what's and hip-hop right and rap. you know it was this cool juxtaposition of different genres like that that hadn't really existed before so much yeah. at, at least on broadway yeah and so that brought you know you had to have those styles in your toolkit there in your little tool bag otherwise you weren't going to make it So the more, it's definitely the more, you know, and the more you can learn as much as you can, you'll be ready for those opportunities. Have those styles down convincingly. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, exactly. uh, Let's see. Dave Clive hanging with us, who, who, uh, from Dave Clive's Scratch Museum and, and of course is no one's funk band. Um, And he was my buddy who was in here a couple of weeks ago with the uh, vintage drum night. Um, He says, uh, Jim and Larry, greetings from Dave Clive's Scratch Museum. Great show tonight. The three of us hung at SEN meeting at the Drummers Collective in New York City oh, on yeah. May 31st. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you were, he was at the diner with us. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and Arnie Lang was hanging with us. Yeah. Uh, rest in peace, Arnie, man. Uh, yep. I'm so glad we got to do that with him. Oh, my God. Yeah. A beautiful man. Beautiful man. Yeah, he, he really was. And um, yep. Dave brought in his, um, his Lang snare drum uh, right. on the vintage drum thing that we did. So it was yeah. really amazing. Yeah. Um, Karen Fetter hanging with us. Hey, Karen, how you doing? Oh, yeah. um, Kelly Ray Tubbs hanging with us. Um, she says, ha, the birth of the tribute band. That must have been when I was talking about Kiss. Um, oh, yeah, like right. dressing up as Kiss. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, John Gill says, I have a high school student who aspires to be a Broadway drummer. She's an excellent reader, performs in the school orchestra and jazz band. What advice can you share with her? Which I think we kind of just addressed in a way, yeah. uh, John. And hopefully yeah, maybe your great. student is listening tonight uh, if she's yeah. if she's into the Broadway scene. I, I'll, as a little sidebar real quick, uh, there's a, a young bassist um, from the area that uh, was in bands with some of my students. And, um, and she started to meet musicians hanging, going to shows, and wow. then hanging at the stage door, and then eventually getting invited to sit and watch in the pit and watch some shows happen. Uh, yeah. to eventually getting to um, sub on Waitress. And then she got oh. eventually got a touring gig with Waitress right out of high Lexi? school. Uh, Lexi? What's that? Lexi, is that her name? Um, no, 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 it's um, Catherine Machete. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I, I don't know that I met her. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Young girl. That's how you do it. That's yeah. how you do it. <laughs> That's how you do it. I mean, she yeah. she literally hung and and just kept showing up and and working yeah. her way in and learning and learning. Uh, I was at a Chick Corea show. I took the kids to see Chick at the Blue Note, and nice. the bass player was just cleaning off his instrument at the end. And I said, "Go up there and talk to him." I just pushed her up there and like you know you. Yeah. That's the thing to do is exposure and then uh-huh. just being there, right? W- would you yeah. say? Oh yeah. But here's the thing. You can be prepared for those moments. Right. You know, what, what that young student is doing right now, you know, learning how to read and playing in the orchestra and getting all of her chops together, right? Yeah. So she's got the skills and then she just needs to meet people. And there's a lot of it is networking. You know, there, there have been many times when I know friends of mine were stuck for finding a sub because everybody that they knew was busy. Just but they didn't know who they didn't know. You know what I mean? So you've got to figure out a way if you're a young uh, aspiring professional musician to get yourself out there to get, and to have, I mean, there's all these things you can do these days. You can have, you need to have a web presence. You need to have a website or a YouTube channel or an Instagram account where you're putting up stuff you're playing and you can put up your bio and stuff that you've done and people that you've studied with it's all going to help you look more credible. It's going to make you more credible. Yeah. 
I had somebody just email me today. Hey, I just moved to New York. I really want to sub on Broadway. Um, you know, what, what do I need to do? And I tell everybody the same thing, you know, you've got to tell me where, what you've done already. Right. What, what have you done? I'm not just going to talk and let everybody off the street, you know, who wants to do it because there's a wide range of people and some people are have it together and other people don't. Right. So I need to know what you've done and who you've studied with and, you know, what kind of professional experience you have. Do you have your web presence down? Do you have some videos or some music samples that you've recorded that you can play? Do you have references of music directors that you work with or like your high school teacher? Because your high school teacher might know somebody who's in the business and say, hey, this is somebody I think is worth giving a shot. Yeah. They've been working hard. This is what they really want to do. And I will talk to everybody. I love it. You know, I love to discover new people and I mentor people and I will kind of assess where they are and then start feeding them gigs based on their experience level. You know, you're not going to walk into New York out of high school and play a Broadway show, most likely. Right. So you're going to have rare. to have done something somewhere else. You're going to have have to play some wedding gigs or maybe you played on a cruise ship for a couple months or you played in a rehearsal band every week, you know, for for beer and, you know, wings or something. <laughs> you, know, you just have, have to have some sort of experience before you're going to walk in there because Broadway is really hard. You don't get a rehearsal when you, at least when you're subbing. Yeah. You don't get a rehearsal. You get the materials, you go and learn them and then you will get one show. Yeah. We'll give you one show and it's sink or swim. It's the most stressful thing you will probably ever do. And either you can bring it or you don't, you know, and I was making this joke with another friend of mine, like the fear is if you come in and you really suck and you really tank it, like you get a Greyhound bus ticket out of town. You, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the scene is so competitive and so small and everybody talks, everybody knows. And if everyone's saying, oh yeah, well, that person went in and subbed that night over there and they really bit it, you know, <laughs> they, yeah, yeah. they missed every cue. All the tempo changes were wrong. They didn't end the song with the conductor. You know, they did a, a big fancy drum solo that was in seven, four time or something. <laughs> and the whole band lost, you know, where the one was. They just decided to improvise in the middle of the show. <laughs> yeah, right. They were like, this is my moment here, you know. <laughs> it's me. It's all about me. Right, right. right. Oh, my God. That's yeah. great. But networking is a, is a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. And you I mean, got to be, you got to be cool. You yeah. got to be fun to be around. You got to be professional. You got to be able to read the room and there's a different vibe in every single show. Some, some pits are really laid back and chill. Some of them are really uptight and you don't do anything, but look straight ahead and play. Right. You, you don't talk to anybody else. You don't smile at anybody else. You don't do anything that they just want it to be like that, you know, yeah. and you have to be able to read the room yeah. to go in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Good question. Very good. Um, was oh. that student a, a drummer? Yes, that was a drummer, yeah. a drum student. That's great. Um, Kelly Ray said, uh, the great Ron Keezer, we've got something in common, Larry. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yep. That's cool. He was great. He was a wonderful, wonderful teacher and a great drummer. And his son is Jeffrey Keezer for all those jazzers out there. Yeah. Probably know amazing pianist amazing pianist oh my god yeah. that, now that that last name i can yeah. hear it that oh wow yeah 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 i was playing when he he was maybe i don't know 16 or something when i was in college and i got to play with him in his combo and it was amazing i mean he was so above and beyond at that point yeah what a great player i and very oh. i feel like kind of not that well known I mean, even in maybe in more mainstream kind of jazz circles, not that well known. Yeah, I think he's super talented. Oh, um, incredible. And he went off to play with Art Blakey like he left and he was maybe 16, 17 or something. Went. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But yeah, Ron Keezer, great musician, great teacher. I owe a lot to that man. Uh, Rocco Deserto, a student of mine hanging with us tonight. Um, nice. Let's see. Um, Annette Aguilar. Hi, Larry. Good to see you. Hey, Annette. All right. Long time. Wow. 
Wow, very cool. Thanks for hanging in that. And um brilliant percussions. Brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. Uh Jules says, Hi Jim and Larry. Larry, what Broadway shows past or present would you love to play? Maybe maybe a show that you've not done. What what oh. would be something either from the past or or that's out there now that you would that's really like fun to do? question to think about. That's fun to think about. Gigi. That was <laughs> Gigi. <laughs> I did play Gigi. I did get to play that show. I played Gigi oh, at awesome. uh, at the uh, Equity. Uh, there was a theater up on um, 102nd on the west side. It was a small theater that was a revival theater, and ah. it was a little up uptown theater that it was. It was nice. It was. It didn't sit that many people, but it was a decent house. Yeah. And um, I did Gigi at that theater. I can't remember oh the name of the theater. I almost said equity yeah. something theater, but it, it was, it was um, some revi- little revival theater. Wow. What's there now? I don't know. I, I yeah. really should find out. And, yeah. and um, that's all we ever did. We're, we're just revival shows of like Gigi, Mame, you know. Like, oh, I didn't know you did shows before, dude. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we'll have so to you- chat <laughs> about <laughs> My humble beginnings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people started doing those. I mean, there there were a lot of shows. Yeah. You know, off Broadway was a thing. There yeah, were lots yeah. of shows everywhere. You know. I did a. And it was a great a great way to learn to yeah. play those gigs. Yeah. You know. My my sister's in here, by the way. I just have to give a shout out to my sister because yeah. I always miss my sister. I'll always like after the show ends. Uh-huh. I, I look at the chat transcript and somehow I always miss my sister. So, hey, Trish, because <laughs> my Trish is um, my sister. Patricia is a nurse up at NYU. So, oh, yeah. Shout nurses. out to all the nurses. Yeah. yeah. Go nurses. Thank you for your service, man. All of the women in my life were nurses, by the way. My mom is a retired wow. nurse. My wife is a nurse. Both yeah. of my daughters are nurses. And my sister is a nurse. And my sister's daughter is in school for nursing. Nurses so, are good people. They are. They are are. really good people. They're tough and they're really super smart. And so, yeah, shout out to all the nurses. Yeah, for sure. Um, So uh, so I just wanted to uh, dive back into a few things. Um, Oh, one one more. Nick uh, Capulos. I played Once Upon a Mattress. Um, oh. in Farmingdale, uh, off, off Broadway, laugh, laugh, la- laughter. Um, yeah, yeah. In, in fact, I, I will say that in high school, I started doing, um, what would be regional, little regional theater stuff. Yeah. So I did a lot yeah. of that in high school. Yeah. So I was doing these gigs all the time and, and, uh, they would run, you know, a couple of months each and it would yeah. be just weekend. It would be like Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday matinee. Um, and I did show after show after show with all these little regional theaters which was really fun that's great um and that's Were a great ever? way to start guys like if you have young yeah. students try to Absolutely. point them towards regional theater even yeah. some high schools and some colleges will hire musicians to come yeah. in when they don't have a strong music program like wagner yeah. college i i worked at wagner college doing productions and there were band directors mostly in the pit different guys that taught yeah. band um, and myself, I was playing drums in, in some of these college pro- productions. Um, yep. So there's a lot of other avenues, you know, towards the show world that I think, you know, sometimes get overlooked. So. Totally. Yeah, there's a lot of work there. Um, and churches, there's a lot of work in churches, depending on, you know, yeah. where you are. There's a lot of churches with music programs, yep. praise bands, that kind of stuff. I mean, Absolutely. it's all good learning ground. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Most of the the few guests that I've had um, over the last few months, most of them have come up playing in church, mm-hmm. which is um, mm-hmm. very, you know, common. But a lot of there can be a lot of work there as yeah. well, you know. Um, so let's see. So we, we did the we did the high school days. We went into the college days. So we started yeah. um, with with the college stuff. And I know we, we kind of jumped ahead into, you know, getting coming to town and all that stuff. But I just wanted in the college thing, did you guys um, do any kind of um, outside of school kind of shows where the college went, you know, little, little tours or, or uh, at venues? Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, we would do stuff like that. The, the jazz band would a lot. And they used it as kind of a recruiting tool okay. to, and we would tour high schools and other colleges in like maybe the four state area, you know, Minnesota and Wisconsin and uh, Illinois. We went out to Indiana, sometimes Iowa even, but really it was, you know, for us to have playing experiences and put on a concert. And then we would do clinics with the, with the other students at the school. And then they would, the college would kind of see, oh, they've got some good musicians, you know, that they wanted to start grooming to bring because they were really trying to build that jazz program. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, college was great for gigging experience. It's what I did all the time. And it's how I paid my way through college because okay. that scholarship dried up after the first year. They were like, oh, sorry, we don't have any more money. Oh, no. <laughs> so I had to figure something out. And so I found uh, a bunch of wedding bands yeah. and a bunch of uh, club date bands. And I had a standing regular Monday night jazz gig at a Chinese restaurant. Oh, wow. I did every, I was playing every night basically and driving all over because it wasn't, you know, Eau Claire is a Wisconsin is a small town, of maybe 50,000 people or something. Wow. So it was not unheard of to drive two hours for a gig. And so, and so then you're driving and you play a four hour gig and drive home. I mean, it was, it was hard work, but I loved it. It was great. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I was very lucky. So now the, the college thing, you graduate. So, so you're done with the college thing. So what are you doing right away? Um, Right. College ends. Yeah. What are we doing? Uh, Let's see. When college ended, the first thing I did was I went out on a cruise ship. Oh, cool. For, th- for three, three months. Um, and I had no idea what it was going to be like. And it, it was such a, um, I was very thankful to my jazz director who recommended me for the gig. Cause he knew I needed this kind of experience because yeah. when you're out on a cruise ship, you're in a house band and you play with whatever act comes on that week. Right. And, and different every week. And sometimes it's, there are two different artists every week. And then you're playing uh, what they call standards, you know, dance music yep. for all the, the older people who like to dance, you know, to the Glenn Miller songs and stuff like that. And I didn't know, there was so much I didn't know. And it was such a wonderful place for me to learn because I was sight reading charts. You had one rehearsal and you do the show that night. Right. And the charts would come on and there'd be like crayon on them and magic marker and you know they were it was a joke Crossing what the charts out. were something yeah Crossing. yeah they would cross something out and then and then the singer would say oh i want to put that verse back in and you were like but if they've crossed it out of magic marker i don't know <laughs> we'll make it up you know you don't you just have to figure out how to make it make it work yeah and it was wonderful experience for me i learned i worked on my reading so much and i sat and practiced in the in the lounge all day because the passengers were off on the island you know having fun and i just would lock myself in there and just shed at that point it was all my dave weckle licks you know and joel right. rosen and stuff cliff almond even man you know i was just you know it was great great experience and i saved up all that money and i was like this is what i want to do i just want to play and so i moved to Minneapolis, which was the closest big town. And in during college, every summer, I would go and play at this amusement park in the live shows. Oh, cool. I had a gig in the summers, six days a week. We'd play six shows a day, six days a week. That's and it was a blast. Yeah. It was so much, it was so much fun. And it taught me how to um, learn to manage my playing, you know, to work on my endurance and pace myself so that I could get through that much. Cause that's a lot of playing Yeah, yeah, for sure. and you can't just go and let it all hang out the first day in the first couple shows. Cause you've got five more days of six more shows a day. So I learned really good maintenance skills and how to, you know, just play all the time and keep it that at a good level. Right. Yeah. And not blowing anything out. So I was doing that. Um, and so doing that, I started to meet people around the Minneapolis Twin Cities area and was very lucky to run into another drummer named Phil Hay, who is a wonderful, wonderful jazzer, beautiful cat, just a beautiful human being. And 
um, he was playing in this big band, this rehearsal big band every Monday night uh, called the Cedar Avenue big band. And uh, they called, they had a last minute emergency or something and called my jazz instructor saying, Hey, we need a drummer. Phil can't make it tonight. You know, do you know anybody? And he said, yeah, Larry Lelly is around. You should, I think he's ready to do it. And it was huge. It was like the biggest, this was like my audition for, for being a drummer in Minneapolis. And I went and I was so scared and freaked out and, but it went really well. And I had a great time and all the guys liked me in the band. And so I got to meet Phil that way. And Phil was like the top call drummer in town. And so he was starting to feed me gigs. He's like, Hey, you're, you know, you're good. You can, you can do this. You can do this, but you got to go do this gig. You got to do this gig. You're going to play brushes the whole night. And you got to do this Latin. You're going to play with this Latin trombone player and, you know, figure that out. And so he was so instrumental in giving me confidence. Yeah. You know, you get out of school and you don't really know what you're doing and you move to a big city and you're trying to meet people and it's hard, but he helped me. He was like, you've got what it takes. You just have to have the experience. And so he was kind of where I started to learn this thing of mentoring people. Yeah. Cause he saw me, he knew this is what I wanted to do. He knew I could do it. So he gave me little pieces, you know, okay, you're going to sub this gig for me. And it's with a, a, a jazz singer and it's a trio and you're playing in a restaurant. So you've got to play pianissimo the whole night. Right. Don't even bring a drumstick, you know? And I was like, what, how do you do that? You know. So I had to sit there and learn how to make it interesting with brushes for three hours or for two hours with this, you know, so he was a wonderful, wonderful man and a uh, mentor to me. And I'm, I've taken that forward, you know, cause if I didn't have that, I would, it wouldn't have led me to all the other things. Yeah. So I, I only stayed there for, oh man, two years. And I realized I wasn't going to get the gig with Prince. So I, <laughs> that's what I wanted at that time. That was the goal. Right. I was like, I'm going to get the gig with Prince, you know? But I knew the I knew all the musicians in that band and um, Michael Bland, who was playing with them at the time. He's like, I'm not leaving anytime soon. Right. I love this gig, you know. <laughs> yeah. Set your sights on something else, kid. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> I would follow them around wherever they were playing, you know, and because he was the monster drummer. Yeah. Too. I mean, just kill it. So. Um, so I was like, all right, I got to go somewhere else. And so I took trips to Los Angeles, Nashville and New York nice. to check them out. Yeah. spent a week in each place, you know, just getting the scene. And um, it's a long story that doesn't <laughs> we don't need to go into, but I ultimately decided on Nashville because it seemed like that was kind of a, an easy uh, approachable market. Right. You know, I met so many drummers just in the one week that I was there just hanging out. Everyone seemed so friendly. And I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'll, I'll try this. We'll see. It's a step up from Minneapolis. And so I went there and I was very lucky. I was, I, um, I sat in at a singer's songwriters, uh, what did they call them? Songwriter circle night yeah. where like 10 different songwriters would come in with tunes that they just wrote that day. And they have a chart and they, and they were, you know, had a house band and um, the drummer of that house band, I had met him uh, a few a few days earlier or something, he said, Hey, I'm playing the songwriter circle. You can come and sit in and play a couple tunes. You know, people can hear you play that way. And so I did, I showed up and he said, okay, you're going to sit in and play. And I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what a Nashville number chart was. I was about point. to ask you, like, I didn't know. you know, that's the first <laughs> oh, yeah. time you've seen those charts, right? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know. I'm like, they hand me the chart and I'm like, well, where's the music? You know, they're like, that's the music. That's the music. What's the matter with you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so the guy just kind of explained, this was kind of the song. It was kind of basically, you know, it was like this Garth Brooks song or something. I was like, oh, okay. I've heard of that before. Okay. And I just played it. And luckily it went very well. And I went back down to sit in my seat and there was somebody came up from the back of the bar and said, Hey, who are you kid? You know, I don't know you. You're not from around here. I said, you know, like I just moved here. I don't know. You know? And he said, well, we got an audition. Uh, that's happening at the end of the week. You know, I want you to come down and, and play. It's for this, this new artist, Faith Hill. Oh, I was like, Oh, okay, great. You know, <laughs> All right. 
I was very lucky. And wow. Um, yeah. And from that, I went to that audition. I didn't get that. I didn't get like the tour. They were, they were doing a, both a radio thing and a big tour. Okay. And I didn't get the tour. But I met somebody else at that audition who said, well, hey, we're auditioning next door for this other band. You want to come and check that out? And I did. And I got that gig. So I was oh. maybe in Nashville a month. That's and great. I got my first like long term. They were doing a, a year long tour. Wow. Yeah. And so I sadly never really spent a lot of time in Nashville. <laughs> I was yeah. on the road for the, the three years that I lived there. Right. Um, but what was the, uh, so the last artist that I was playing with was named Doug Stone, who was a huge, huge platinum selling artist at the time. They called him the country balladeer. Okay. And, um, I, he, and he was wonderful. And I was the band leader. I had this great gig playing great music, touring all around, you know, playing stadiums with 20,000 people in them. You know, it was the big time. And I was like, I'm not happy. I don't like being on the road. My relationship is suffering from it, you know, because there weren't cell phones and the internet back then. Right. And I'm like, I'm, I'm just, I'm not having a good time. I'm like living for these two hours a day. And then I'm sitting on a bus for 22 hours a day. Yeah. And so um, Doug had a, a minor heart attack and he's okay, okay, but he canceled the rest of the tour. Oh wow! And I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do? What am I doing? I'm going to go to New York. I've always just wanted to go to New York. I'm just going to go and check it out. And um, so I just bought a plane ticket because I suddenly had nothing on my schedule. And there, I wasn't playing really any gigs in town because Nashville is super clicky. Yeah. Like you're a road guy, you're a session guy, you're a demo guy, or you're in the Christian uh, country scene or the Christian music scene. There were all these very specific clicks. But I just started taking trips to New York because I had all this free time. And I called up the one person that I knew in New York. And I said, hey, I'm here visiting. Can, you know, what should I do? And, and he was a, a bassist, a jazz bassist. And he said, hey, well, yeah, why don't you call um, one of my friends? One of my is, is playing a Broadway show. And maybe you could go and like sit in the pit. I was like, OK, cool. And so very gradually over like a period of maybe three months and a bunch of trips to New York, I started meeting guys who were playing Broadway shows and I would call them up and say, Hey, I'm in town. I just got off the road with Doug Stone. So they kind of knew that I was already at a professional level. Right. Right. And um, would just sit in the pit and meet, meet a new drummer and a bunch of new musicians and a, a conductor and see what was going on. And I started to get really intrigued and I was like, I'm just going to, come here. I'm going to try to do this. I think, I think I can do this. I'm just going to give it three months. And so I did, I just packed up my drums and some clothes and all my CDs. And I drove to New York, like a crazy person. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing, but I just knew I wasn't happy, you know, being on the road in Nashville. Right. I, I felt there was something else I was supposed to be doing. And it ended up being the best move I ever made. Because I love, I love New York City and I love the Broadway community, and I've been very fortunate. It's like things yeah. happen for a reason. Like that tour got canceled, and then, you know, yeah, then New York. Yeah, well, how they crazy. say one door closes and another door opens, kind of thing, right? Yeah. Plus, you know, if you'd gotten that Faith Hill gig, who knows what what would happen? They hired some um, some schlubby kid named Vinny, right? Later on, <laughs> Vinny did. <it. laughs> I couldn't believe that. I couldn't leave. Right? Like what? <laughs> yeah. Vinny yeah. Calyuta's playing with Faith. Well, that's actually that's something really good to point out to everybody. Vinny, look at a guy like Vinny. He can do anything. Anything. Yeah. Anything. You know, that's why he's working all the time. Yeah. He doesn't need to be, you know, he can also pull out every crazy chop and blow your mind, but he can then sit down and play with Sting or he can play with Faith Hill or, you know, I mean yeah. That's that's why he's working all the time because he can do it all. That's it. Yeah. Total chameleon. By the way, yeah. uh, Peter Retzlaff hanging with us. Peter, yeah. what's up? Me. Me. Uh, Dave Stanhope hanging with us. Yo, Dave. Nice, what's up? Dave. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So Dave is another great guy. I'm glad he, he's on. He helped me in Minneapolis too. 
he was another really great and he kind of got me into the show thing in minneapolis oh okay before i knew that was like going to be my future <laughs> he was i can't remember i'm gonna have to ask dave uh we did i subbed for him on something it was great it was really fun dave's a great drummer too man yeah, yeah. beautiful yeah, yeah thanks yeah. for showing up dave He's a great, he's a great guy. And, um, I've great spent a teacher. lot of time working on his tech with him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another okay. one. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and he's been a guest on the show and so is Peter Redslaff. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, man. Um, so I have some like speed round questions that, I, oh. that I want to break okay. out and, um, right. I'll, I'll monitor the chat cause maybe Dave has, uh, knows what okay. that show was. Um, yeah. but so, and drummers, by the way, um, I'm going to go down a list of drummers where I kind of just want like first reactions from you. And since uh, we already mentioned Vinny, I just want to mention one thing about Vinny. I always, I say this every show pretty much. Um, one thing that's funny with Vinny is um, there's, there's a record um, by Nick Kershaw called the works. Uh, Are you uh -huh. familiar with that? Yeah. 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 So I always mention that track Cowboys and Indians, which is uh -huh. it's like in three, and it's a really yeah. interesting groove, but there's a fill after the first chorus before it goes back to the, uh, the verse. And he's uh -huh. just, he's playing basically, um, like dotted eighth pulse, but uh -huh. it's quintuplets in, in five stroke <laughs> rolls. Right. So he's just going, dash, 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 uh -huh. and then back into the thing. And it's just like, Oh, of course, you know, it's like so beautiful. <laughs> Um, but the other thing that's really fun with Vinny is uh, that reel, and somebody put it together on YouTube, of every opening of the Joan Rivers show uh -huh. stacked one after another, a year of shows, every oh, single four-bar solo. Yeah. Because he, he, he would take four bars at the top. Yeah. So it would be like, yeah. Joan Rivers, and then uh -huh. the band's playing, uh -huh. and he does a four-bar break. And then it would be Joan yeah. Rivers, and there's another yeah. one. And there's like a 100 of them. It's like insane. But, and um, everyone is different. Every single right? one is different, yeah. and every yeah. one of them like blows your mind. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, um, by the way, uh, Dave said, "Was that the Leibowitz sisters show?" Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the lovely Leibowitz sisters. The lovely oh. Leibowitz. That sounds like something that you know um, Ed Sullivan would be introducing, right? Oh, it was so fun. Oh, so much fun. That's great. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> he goes, I'm getting to the point where I can't remember anymore either. Uh, okay. hey. Join the club, man. Yeah. Um, oh. So, all right. So I'm going to put on my my goggles here, and I'm going to go through okay. a few speed round questions for you. Um, good hang tonight. We had a lot of nice drummers hanging with us. Um, nice. So uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to do – so uh, I'll go to the drummer names in a, in a second, but uh, – so first um record you bought with your own money beach boys it was beach boys greatest hits wow all right cool beach yeah. boys nice um first drum you ever owned uh a, it was a 60s a late 60s slingerland kit kit oh, nice. like real drum real drum set right like real drum yeah 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 cool they were they were great they were great do you still have them or no no i sold them yeah i was I'm, a dummy i sold all my stuff i mean eventually i gave yeah. away though that first red ludwig red sparkle ludwig kit that i i was using at the the metal venues yeah yeah half of that kit was like a new maple that was made to match the old kit but the old kit was oh. a, was a really early 70s red sparkle and i gave uh -huh. that to a student um, that's so beautiful good for you man that i felt good about passing that yeah. to a student yeah yeah um the first concert you ever attended oh <laughs> like on my own or with my mother because my mother took me to one that i really remember because it was also i was very young um it was a barbershop quartet really at a at the college she was going to college in Wisconsin, and she took me to this barbershop quartet concert. I thought it was the greatest thing. Oh my God, that's so amazing. Cool. Yeah. That was the first one that I remember going to. What about the like the first band, like where you went on your own, maybe? Yeah. 
I think that was the Jay Giles band. By the time I was old enough oh, wow. to go to a show, and I had to go with like chaperones too. Yeah. Because I, I wasn't really old enough to go. I think it was the Jay Giles band. Yeah. I'll tell you. They were really hot at that time too. Like oh. I was really into it. I saw 1982, I saw Jay Giles band, The Clash, oh, yeah. and The Who at Shea Stadium together. Wow. So it was like The oh. Clash played first, then Jay Giles uh, played, and then it was The Who. Wow, that must have been great. Yeah, 1982. We went wow. in a Volkswagen bug with like six guys <laughs> smashed into a Volkswagen Beetle. Um, pretty funny. Yeah, crazy stuff we do. <laughs> oh, Dan Tragley is hanging with us. Hey, Dan. Dan. Dan the man. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Um, all right. So um, first drum hero. And Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich. Yeah. I that was so. the first one, really. Yeah. Yeah, kind of for me too. I I say this a lot, but I saw him at at uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music when I was twelve. My dad took me to see oh, Buddy Rich at, that's at Brooklyn beautiful. Academy of Music. Yeah, and Mel Torme was singing. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I bet that's crazy. amazing. The Velvet oh, Fog. Totally amazing. <laughs> and Mel got up and played drums for a little bit, which was yeah, cool. yeah. Um, he was a pretty good drum. Your first big gig, stadium gig. That was the guy in Nashville, right? Doug Stone. Yeah. What Doug was Stone. his name again? Doug Stone. Doug Stone. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, the worst or weirdest gig you ever had. <laughs> oh man. How do I tell it without outing somebody? <laughs> you can leave the names out, right? <laughs> <laughs> somebody will know. I like, played, uh, about me. I played one of the first gigs that I did in New York. I'm not going to say where it was. It was the one and only wedding gig that I did. And okay. it was right when I first got to town and somebody recommended me to somebody. And it wasn't any of the musicians' fault that the gig was awful. It's just everything leading up to it went entirely wrong. Like, wow. my car got towed and oh. I, I couldn't find where, where my car was. And I had to get all my drums out of my studio and all the way over to this really fancy restaurant. And I was, it was winter and it was snowing. And it was um, when I finally got, and this was before cell phones. So the band leader's freaking out, you know, he, and he can't get a hold of me and I can't tell anybody anything. I'm just trying to get there as fast. I, I basically get in about 15 minutes before the downbeat of the gig. Right. And everybody's freaking out and they're making me drag my drums through the kitchen, you know, and they're like in there cooking salmon and stuff like that. And, and I'm like, what am I, this is awful. And then the people, the clients were awful people. They didn't like any of the music that we were oh, playing. Yeah. And there was a fight broke out, you know, in the wedding party, like the bride and somebody else like duking it out. And the cops got called. I mean, it was just <laughs> that pretty much sums up like most weddings in New York. Come on. <laughs> oh, my God. That's hilarious. It was insane. It was insane. I was like, I'm never doing this again. What am I doing? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, that's oh. great. <laughs> oh, man. Um, okay. Uh, how about your best gig or favorite, you know, show that you've done? Ah, oh, gosh, there's so, I'm so lucky. I'm so fortunate, man. I, I could not list one because there've been so many. Nice. I'm just the luckiest drummer boy ever. I mean, the, just getting a shot on Broadway was a, the biggest deal to me yeah. in the world because I knew how special it was. Um, and who was I coming in here, you know? And I knew that it was just my moment that I like, I really had to bring it and I had to prove myself and it was either sink or swim. And I was, you know, I would either get to do it and get into the club or I would be forever shamed and told, <laughs> you know, to go back to the Midwest, Yeah, <laughs> you know, back to the Midwest boy, you came so, from and, boy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that was another really wonderful person in my life. His name was Michael Hinton, the percussionist at Miss Saigon. Oh, wow. Who gave me my very first shot. That was a hard show. Miss Saigon. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I remember talking to Ray Marchica about that show because I think yeah. Ray played it, right? Yeah, he did. He played that revival. Yeah, that just yeah. Happened. Oh, my it, God. The hardest show I've ever had to do in my life because it was originally written for three players and they reduced it to two players in New York because there wasn't enough room. Oh, my God. The- and so you were often playing two different things at the same time. Oh, my God. Like playing four mallet marimba and timpani at the same time or gongs you know and i mean it was insane it was insane oh my god but it was 
I mean, that, that started it all for me. I wouldn't be here right now if I hadn't had that opportunity. I owe Michael my career, you know, <laughs> and yeah. he opened the doors to me. And, and then it was like, yeah. All about people, man. Yeah. The whole... So be kind, be kind. Yeah, man. You know? <laughs> be don't, a good person. Don't be a jerk. That's right. Because <laughs> you'll get kicked out really fast. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that goes for pretty much every musical situation. You know, it's like, yeah, nobody wants to. Yeah. I mean, well, we all know that we've worked with some difficult people, but it's like, you know, really, it goes a long way, especially drummers. Yeah. I think drummers are pretty good people. Most of us, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And it, and it's important because we're we're the glue. We're trying to hold everything together. You know, exactly. You're yeah, sort yeah. of MDing under the MD half the time. So, um <laughs> <laughs> pre-show routine do you have a pre-show routine oh gosh well it's different now for me because i'm i've gone into the contractor position so right. my pre-show routine is mostly about uh you know making sure that the band is there and the schedule is done and the payroll is done uh, those kind of things yeah um and so i and i have a very loose warm-up thing that i do i just stretch i do stretches Okay. Because I'm getting older and my body's getting, it's body's like, what rebellion. are you doing? What do you, you want to hit the drums every day? For, you know what? So I do stretches and um, just very light warm ups on the kit because I'm in a booth at this show. So I can actually play and not really disturb anybody. Oh, cool. But I'm not one of those people who has like, you know, and I got to go through every page of this book, you know, <laughs> wrist twisters. The I do stick and... control, the whole book. Yeah, I do all yeah, the stick right. control before right. the show. Some people do. Yeah, Some yeah. people. And that's great. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's all what, what you kind of need to get in the in the zone. I really just right. need to have quiet time and to focus. Yeah. Because I want to be 100 percent present during the show because Broadway is live theater. Things go wrong all the time. Right. You can't just show up. And that's the thing with long running shows. Some people might fight with the monotony of it. Like, oh, I'm playing the exact same thing again for the 200th time or whatever. But I don't approach it that way. I'm like, I'm playing the show for the very first time. Right. At, in that moment. And it's live and anything can happen. And I want to be totally present and focused and making a musical thing that will never exist again. That's the cool thing for us is that music that you make, it exists in that moment of time and then it's gone. And you get another chance the next day, if you're lucky like me, right, to do it again. And what's it going to be? It's going to be different yeah, because you've got a different audience. You might have different cast members in. You almost always have different band members. you got an, a different guitar sub that night or right. a different conductor or whatever. So I like to just be very focused and mindful and present. I was going to say, this is like mindfulness of music, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, yep. it's deep. I mean, you know, it's, you're, you're not able to recreate the music um, and rewrite the music because it is the music. It is what it is. Right. But, but I love what you said about your approach is that you're playing it that day for the first time ever, you know, it's. Yep. Um, and that audience is hearing it for the first time. Most of them. Right. They're experiencing that for the very first time and they may have saved up their money for weeks and weeks and weeks yeah. and their vacation day and their big trip into the city. And, you know, for that moment, for that unique live experience, I've, it feels like an honor to do that. And so I want to right. really be present for that and respect that. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the cast kind of becomes a family, I think. Right. I mean, Oh yeah. When you're working with people, you know, for a long period of time, especially cast members that are there for a long time, it really does become a family. And now you're yeah. involved in it on a different level because you're contracting and also getting into producing now. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, how is that? You Fairly know, different. Yeah. I mean, there's this sort of administrative side and business side to it now. Did you ever think that you were going to go into it in that that deep? No, absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, I never thought I'd be playing on Broadway. That wasn't right wasn't the goal or the thing, you know, it just kind of happened. That's how the path kind of laid itself out in front of me. And I chose to follow it. Yeah. And I love it. It's been the best thing ever. Yeah. But producing that just came because um, what we didn't talk about it much today is as a Broadway drummer, you're often one of the very first people in the rehearsal room. Right. 
when a brand new musical is taking shape and starting to be developed. And you may be there with the director and the choreographer and the music director and a pianist right. and a drummer while you're just, it's just them fleshing out ideas and you're, you don't have any music. You're just making it up, you know? So the, the choreographer or the music director will say, okay, this is going to be a song. It's kind of in this style. So play something, you know, just play it, start playing along. Yeah. That happens all the time. And because I got, I was so fortunate to be able to do that so many times and create so many new shows. I was sitting there in the corner watching these shows get put together over and over so many different, I can't even, I've lost track of how many shows I've helped develop, but I started to really learn what works and what doesn't. And I could watch them change things, take something that wasn't, wasn't working and change it to a way that it was working. And then the opposite as well. I'd sit there and watch them take something that was good. <laughs> Destroy it. And change, yes. And ruin it. <laughs> oh my God. And so it started to just inform me. And after you do that for 20 years, right. you start to get your, I mean, I guess I'm just entrepreneurial that way or something, but I was started to get my own ideas. Like, Hey, I might have an idea of how to make this better, you know, or how to make this work or, and I did so many demos for new shows. I was always working on new stuff and it just was a natural next step for me right. because I love it so much. I love what we do so much. And I love creating something and sharing it with an audience. It's the, one of the best feelings ever. Wow. So it's kind of crazy that I went into that. <laughs> and have you, have you kind of dabbled in composing the stuff? Oh yeah, I've written a lot. I haven't written any Broadway musicals, but I wrote a lot of music. In back in the day, whatever I was into, I would write. Do you like think I wrote you would you know, big band charts. Yeah, you know, and I learned how to orchestrate. And I wrote when I lived in Nashville. I wrote a lot of country songs because I was pitching them to artists and stuff. I've always been writing. Do you and think, I wrote. What's that? I was going to say. Do you think all those experiences writing these different things would would eventually lead you to composing something for Broadway? Do you think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I wrote for TV for a while. I wrote comedy for TV for a while. Oh, wow. And so I, I see the book, how the, we call it the book. The, it's what the story is of a Broadway musical. It's called yeah. the book. I see how you take the book and you blend it together with the music. Yeah, so I, I'm totally open to doing something like that. Wow. I am currently working on one thing that's going to be, I don't know what it's going to be yet. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's going to be funny, though. I like, to, I like to live in the comedy world. I like the funny. The funny uh -huh. is good. <laughs> nice. All right. Sweet. All right. Here's the drummers. Ready? So you're going to give me first impressions. Oh, okay. So just, you know, whatever pops in your head. So we don't have to go down a rabbit hole of every guy, but okay. you know. so okay. um, let's do, um, let's do Jeff Picaro. Oh, the sweetest man. The kindest, sweetest man. It's where I really learned that you could be a badass musician and you didn't need to be a jerk. You could still be really beautiful. And he shared his love of music with everybody. I mean, he, yeah. I was lucky enough to get to meet him when I was very young. And he sat and talked to me and answered all my questions. Did he come into yeah. your school? Uh, no, it wasn't my school, but it was um, a music store. Oh, okay. He needed to do a clinic at a music store. Yeah, beautiful. But I mean, man, what can you talk about his playing? I mean, that hasn't been said. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Status. Of course. So deep, so heavy. Um, so big influence, big influence. Beautiful uh, man. Tony Williams. Ah, monster. <laughs> monster. Um, how about Jack DeJanet? Oh, another really kind beautiful man and a right. brilliant musician, a brilliant composer. Great. I mean, he's a great all around musician. You know, he doesn't just play drums. I, you know, that, that solo record that he did called parallel realities. Uh -huh, uh -huh. When that came out, I just remember like he has that thing called nine over reggae on it. <laughs> right. And it's just, he wrote it, you know, I think it's yeah. like um, Dave Holland, Pat Metheny and, and Jack DeJanet just, Killer. Yeah. He's so great, man. Yeah. Uh, how about... His touch. Oh, yeah. His touch is so yeah. great. Yeah. How about uh, David Garibaldi? Oh. How do you... 
<laughs> <I know. laughs> Talk about it. I mean, you pick such great people huh? and so different. They're all so different. Yeah. This is what I mean about being inspired by everybody. Yes. You know, don't just like be this, this person is the best drummer or whatever. Cause Garibaldi has his whole, that whole linear thing that just yeah. blew my mind. Totally. And I just ripped off so much stuff from him over the years. <laughs> Another and beautiful person. Beautiful, kind person, sweetheart. I helped yep. him with his tech. <laughs> Which is, nice. Good. So I spent Good. a lot of time with him over the last couple of years. Um, and he Good. pops into the lives every once in a while. And, he, you know, it's really oh, fun. Cool. He'll pop in. He also did one of these, which was super nice. awesome. Nice. Um, we, we already mentioned it, but Steve Gadd, we have to mention Steve Gadd. Again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just he, he again, someone who can do anything. Yeah, totally. And he plays with such he play, like plays for blood. Like it's yeah. the most important thing that he's that exists in the world when he is playing. Yeah. His intention behind oh what God. he plays is, I mean, that's what fills my heart with joy. Yeah. I love, I just love Anna and another beautiful, kind person. And just, still to this day, I mean, if you go yeah. see, you know, make sure if, if anybody's watching this, that's a young drummer that has never seen him play. Go oh, yeah. see, make sure you see him play. Yeah. Don't yep. take people for granted because we're not no. going to have these guys forever. And right. there's, I have a lot of regrets, like when I was younger, of guys that I didn't get to go see that I should have seen. And so yeah. don't let that happen. Um, yeah. How about, let's jump to, uh, how about, I'm not going to mention Buddy because we already did, <laughs> Simon Phillips. Oh, another beautiful man. You're, all these drummers are such beautiful people. They are. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful people. And maybe that's what makes them such beautiful musicians as well. Simon was, I mean, how old was he when he was playing with Pete Townsend? Like 12? <laughs> yeah, he was like crazy. He was very young. Crazy. Teenager. He's so good. And and I what I loved about Simon and what I took from him was that was it opened up my playing. Cause you know, yeah. I'm a right-handed guy and I play like this when I was a kid, because that's how you set it up. But then I watched him play and I was like, oh, look at that. He just opened up the kit. Yeah. Yeah. Like so he can play like this or like this or, you know, whatever. I love it, it was freeing and it was hard to work on it too. <laughs> yeah. Really hard. His yeah. feel is so good. His musicality is so incredible. Um, yeah. And he's a sweetheart. I've met him, you know, a couple of times and yeah. just the nicest. And um, going back to that Pete Townsend record, what he played on Give Blood, you ever see the, the, um, the live give blood there's like background oh. singers and horns like this really big oh, really? show that they did in in i think in england uh -huh. and his playing on it you know it's like it's just the feel is so good on that tune oh I, yeah i got hooked into that record when i was a, a kid because i just that tune drew me in yeah. just the way he made it feel i don't know and oh, those yeah. He's got a such a huge pocket, just deep. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Centering, you know, it just centers everything. And and really, if you know anybody was going to replace Jeff Picaro, who you know really no one can, but in in yeah. Toto, he was such a great fit for that band. Oh yeah. You know. Oh totally. Um, yeah. Yeah. So cool. Um, how about a couple more here? Somebody, Ash Stone. Oh. I I have not met him ever uh, and only know his playing a little bit, but he's a beautiful musician. Isn't he? Beautiful. I bring yeah. him up What's all the he time. What's up to right now? I have not. He's got been... this windmill in in England. That he, For real? He like built a, a studio in a windmill and he calls wow. it Windmill Studios, I think. But it's it's built in a windmill and he's doing sessions out of there, remote sessions. And he he has a really busy Instagram page where he he posts clips uh -huh. all the time, uh -huh. and he's he's doing all these incredible stuff out of his windmill studio. Which so I right. I really love Ash, and I bring him up. And a lot some guys don't even know who he is, and uh -huh. I I always seem to bring him up because I love his playing and his approach. And he's a sweetheart and a really warm human. Um, I'm not surprised to hear. And that. I love yeah. what he did with Seal. Um, yeah. So he played on that Seal stuff, and it's just oh my god, just incredible so great feel he and, using those taos drums too if you have some of those you know those big taos those giant um they're like basically made of trees oh maybe yeah, you know, yeah they maybe. just take a big like giant tree and cut <laughs> a section of it off and hollow it out 
and strap some skin on it, you know. Oh my god. I think I, I seem to remember he had some of those at one point. Wow. Oh, Jerry Murata were into those. Um okay. Uh, I'll give you two more. So let's see. Let let's do John Bonham. Bonham. Oh man, what what can you say? <laughs> <laughs> I ripped off so much of his stuff, especially his footwork. Yeah. He was, just, he was another really passionate player. Right. And I never got to see him play live. Yeah. I mean, sadly. yeah, but, uh, but definitely influenced, you know, on record. And, oh, and yeah. what I love My sometimes, man, yeah. sometimes it's just all groove. Like, you know, yeah. I mean, he's, and he had chops, he had everything, but sometimes it's just what he's playing is just all, time and all groove yeah, and you're simple, just like oh man groove. yeah and it just feels so great you know yeah um yeah. all right so should we go old school or new school let's do how about since i had him on the show how about james gadson Any i'm not familiar him? with a lot of his play i know who he is I'm not familiar with a lot of his playing interesting yeah yeah so i mean the the bill withers stuff is probably like his you know dyke and the blazers but bill withers uh, stuff is really cool, but he's been doing sessions all the way through um, 2020, and he's living in LA. And you know his health isn't great, but he's he's a sweetheart of a guy. And um, he was doing sessions for Beck in 2019. Oh, great! And I mean, Justin Timberlake. <laughs> you know, it's like what? Nice. Yeah. Nice. So you know, he's getting up there. He's like 82 now. Sweetheart wow. of a guy. Great player. Um, super simple, but look up the, look up the tune "Kissing My Love." Okay, and listen to the the drumming on "Kissing My Love." It's ridiculous. Okay. Oh, and Love by it. the way, he played on um, he played on Donald Fagan's uh, "Nightfly" record, and did he? Yeah, and the shuffle the the shuffle. Why am I blanking on this shuffle tune? Um, that I thought that was Steve Jordan on that. Wait, hold on. I, I'll just tell you which the tune was. Um, oh, is it just like a couple tunes or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. It's wait, where are we? Um, Walk between the raindrops. And you, you I'm gonna, I'll, if I can. Wait, let me see. Maybe I could just play it for. I you. love that record so much, man. I know it's uh, ridiculous. Um, where are we? Okay. Oh yeah, hold on. <laughs> I, I gotta pull it up real quick. Um. Because then you're going to go, oh, wow, what? Really? <laughs> um, it's it's funny. I have it on one of my, um, I have a student that's like, oh, right. No, no. It's, uh, here we go. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is him. So what's so cool about this is this shuffle, there's no fills, right? Right. Really. Straight ahead, man. And um, every once in a while, there's an anticipation on the kick that's just like, Gives you goosebumps. Have you talked? I'd love to talk to him about recording this, you know? Oh my God, I know. Like, how, so like, did, was he just like dictated the part that he had to play? Because, you know, they're so specific. Fagan's so specific. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. really specific. Um, yeah. So, Heard he told me some stories about, he's told me some fun stories. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I keep meaning to, it's so ridiculous. I have to ask Purdy to be on the show. Oh, yeah. Because. And um, clear out like six hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've <laughs> had great conversations with him the few times that I've gotten to hang with him and meet him. Yeah. But, um, yeah. man, I got, I have specifics that I have to ask him about yeah. sessions. And definitely right. like that stuff, man, I would love to hear his stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For sure. He seems to remember like everything. Yeah. Got a good, really good memory. You know? He's yeah, done yeah. so much. He's done so much. Oh, my God. Indeed. Man, Larry, this was super fun. I, I could keep, fun, I could easily keep you on here for a couple more hours, but I'm going <laughs> to let you get back to your life. Um, <laughs> but um, it was definitely good fun. I have I have on, on the out here, I have one thing. So everybody go to Larry's website, um, LarryLilly.com. It's in the description of this video. If you're... If you have an, an aspiring student that wants to be on Broadway, a great way to learn about Broadway is take lessons from drummers that have worked on Broadway. Yeah. Larry gives lessons. Look him up. Uh, Larry does master classes and clinics, but look him up and do private lessons, man. Um, what a great way to get inside the lens 
of what's going on in the Broadway world, right? So, and um, any companies we should be plugging? I know you're a Yamaha artist. Oh, yeah, Yamaha forever and ever and ever. And uh, Sabian, of course, we have that mutual. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Vic Firth, Remo. Yep. Um, Latin percussion. Uh, well, who am I forgetting? Oh, you know what I should, that I always tell everybody, I don't have any kind of artist deal with them or anything, but I always tell everybody about these things. Um, rock and sock drum thrones. When you're playing, <laughs> you've got one, yeah. Three of them in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they have saved my butt literally so much. Yeah. Because when you're playing on Broadway eight shows a week, you know, you want something comfortable to sit on. The shows are, can be three hours long. Yeah. Well, I always tell everybody about those. They're the beautiful people. It's made in, in America. You know, it's really good stuff. They're good people. Um, and also, uh, Gordy Knudsen, who's a killer drummer uh, in Minneapolis, played with Steve Miller back in the day, wow. makes these. I bet I might even have some. GK Ultraphones. This is totally an unsolicited plug. But yeah, I've gotten yeah. almost everybody all over Broadway using these things because they're really great speakers. Yep. But they're isolation phones and they're comfortable. They're like a lot of companies make things like this. These are the most comfortable and the best sounding ones. Yeah. And any show that you're doing where you've got a, most of us, we have a mixer in the booth. Um, these will save your ears. It's just so great if you don't want to go with something like in-ears or whatever. I right. also use Future Sonics in-ears, which are also really great. Yeah, yeah. But these are just so, so comfortable and so reliable and sturdy. Like I've had this pair probably for like three years. Nice. I've had the same pair in the pit since we started, and that was 2016. Wow. And they still sound great, right? They sound great. <laughs> and they, they get a beating. They take a beating in there. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Did um, I forget anybody? I don't know. I'm very fortunate and I've had such wonderful relationships with all those companies. And I play that gear because it's the best and it works the best for me. And Especially it's people again, it's, it's people. Yeah. There's people behind these companies <laughs> like yeah. Sabian are yeah. just beautiful people. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have a relationship with a, with a, with a company, but you have a relationship with the people behind that company. And if you yeah. treat it well and you're a good person and, and, you know, you, you support them and they'll, they'll support you. So yeah, yeah. indeed, indeed. Um, and That's great. two little things on the way out favorite yeah. living in New York, favorite pizza in New York. <laughs> oh, that's going to be tough. That's going to be tough. I'm, do you know this place called Celeste? I don't. It's an Italian place on the Upper West Side. They make real Italian pizza, really? you know, brick oven. Yeah. 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 The real deal. Celeste. Nice. Yeah. Celeste. It's on the Upper West Side. Cash only. No reservations. Little hole in the wall. Right. The guy, the owner, like, goes to Italy, at least back in the day. He would go there twice a month and bring back cheese and salami and stuff, you know. Oh, that's awesome. Um, or if I'm in Times Square, I really like John's. Yeah. John's, John's is good. Pizza. Yeah. Yeah. When I was a when I was a kid, it was the original Rays on on 11th. Yeah. Um, but What's... when I when I was in the music building a lot, dollar pizza became like a thing, you know, in New York. <laughs> right. Dollar pizza, like for a buck, you could get a, you know, throw down a dollar. You get a uh -huh. very fresh slice because they're oh, making yeah. it so fast because yeah. it's yeah. a buck. So it's just going out the door. <laughs> so across from the music building on 38th Street, we used to get dollar yeah. pizza all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jim Mola would say Lorenzo's in Bay Ridge. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> oh, Lombardi's. No, no. I take that back. Lombardi's in Bay Ridge. Oh, well, yeah. are th those are the two that are like, yeah. you're either one or the other, right? Yeah, I think so. So I just can't get myself to get out there, man. I'm too lazy. I'm too much of a Manhattan. <laughs> you know, I'm like, Brooklyn? Ah. I know. I know. It's too, too long a hike. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, man. Well, and and but at least you you can get away and go upstate and get out of the city, which is awesome. I'm very fortunate. Yeah, I'm yeah. very fortunate. That, yeah. That's great. Oh yeah. man. Um, so man, what a great hang tonight. I really appreciate your you. generosity with your time and your stories 
and um, and I love going down the drum nerd rabbit hole with you. That was super fun. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully thanks. one day we'll do it again. And um, yeah. Yeah. thanks to everybody who's in the chat tonight hanging with us. And uh, we appreciate you as well. And of course, uh, sign up for the mailing list. Check it out. I have lots more live streams coming up. And uh, next week, uh, studio veteran Alan Schwartzberg <laughs> is going to awesome. be on the show. Alan's a, a good friend of mine, and he's a super funny guy. And the week after that, I have uh, Rodney Howard on the show. So Rodney, Rodney's yeah. going to be hanging. Yeah, so um, very cool. That's so great. thank you, everybody. Thank you, Larry. And, Thanks, Jim. Um, we'll talk to everybody blast. real soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you.